open your Bibles. It'll be on the screen behind us too at, at some point here. And you can put your finger in uh, chapter one of Colossians. And just, uh, just a little kind of um, catch, catch us up here, just a few things to remember because the text today is very dependent on the purpose that Paul had for writing the entire letter. And so we have to remember that Paul is writing to uh, this church in Colossae, the church, these, these small little house churches, and uh, there is a culture of tolerant pluralism throughout this, this city. I mean, this is the way they live. This is kind of the air they breathe, that there's lots of gods. The thought that there's only one god sounds pretty crazy. And then you have Jewish culture, which is also there. And they're on kind of the other side, the pushback, where they're not associating with Gentiles. And they're still trying to follow the Old Testament law, which would have been really difficult away from Jerusalem, especially. And so Paul is writing um, to confront these uh, two deviations of the gospel that come from, that come from these two kind of areas. Now, the first is the pluralism that's disguised with biblical undertones such as angels. And it's this, this and, and secret kind of insider knowledge that's being pushed. And secondly, he's, he's con, um, confronting this idea that, that conforming to human traditions and OT law is somehow part of the gospel. That, that the Jews uh, felt like, you know, it's really unfair if the Gentiles just get to, to be <laughs> without having to go through all the stuff and initiation things that the Jews had to. And so this is a huge switch uh, the gospel. We're actually going to talk about that today uh, in, in more detail. And so Paul is pushing back against that. And so these ele- the elements of these two different cultures, um, the negative parts of these cultures, not like, it's not that Colossae had a horrible culture. It's just like culture is just how people live together, right? <laughs> and so the, the negative elements, especially the religious um, paganism kind of stuff that, that crept in uh, to their definition of the gospel is what's going on here. That's why Paul uses in the, in the opening verses that he's presenting the true gospel. He doesn't often say true. He just says the gospel. And so what we have Paul uh, laying out for the Colossians is that the gospel plus anything is not the gospel. You can't add stuff to it. It is complete. And so where we were last week, uh, we left off in the text. And remember, this is a letter, right? There, there's no chapter headings or verses. This is a letter that's penned out, and, and away we go. The way we preach it, however, makes it sometimes feel like this section, this section. It is all one letter. And so Paul has just talked about what, what Jesus has done through Christ, what God's purpose was, that Jesus was the, in the exact image of the invisible God. You want to know what God's like? You look at Jesus. The exact image. And then he goes on to go on like the the purpose behind Jesus sacrificing and giving him his life was so that all people, all humans could be reconciled. Now he just introduced uh, an idea that would be very difficult for some to, to accept. That it would be for everyone. And so he had just kind of outlined this idea before he gets into this, what this mystery of the gospel is. He's made sure everyone knows the purpose, that reconciliation is at the very heartbeat and core of the gospel. So now, let's get into our text. We're going to start from verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. So Paul is giving us, he's letting us in on something here. This is what he is about. This is a commission that God has given him, that he is making the word of God fully known, which the word of God in the New Testament, when it says the word of God, it's talking about the gospel that's making this the gospel known to all the people. <laughs> okay, to make it fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. 
to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In him, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. All right, so we're just going to march through this text. Uh, this is, so I, and maybe just a kind of a right off, a confession, right off the start, I cannot do this justice. Part of the anxiousness that's been in me is that I, this text is beyond preachability. <laughs> uh, I've heard this, I've heard this text actually preached quite a few times. I've preached it before. There is no way to do it justice. It is incredible, this mystery that Paul is, is uh, revealing for us. And so I'm going to do my best, but at the end of it, if you are encouraged and the Spirit of God speaks to you, it's because it's him. He's doing it. This is his message, and uh, yeah, it is incredible. So I'm going to do my best, but in the end, uh, it's, it, this, this, needs to come, you know, this needs to come home through the Holy Spirit. So first off, uh, Paul introduces this idea of suffering. Now, uh, again, playing off of what he just talked about, right? Christ's suffering. That Christ's suffering is actually provided all humanity with the opportunity for reconciliation with God, to restore the the relationship that was broken to begin with between God and humans. And so there's there's three three areas here that I want to quickly go through uh, talking about... uh, Is my mic cutting out here? Sorry. Oh, it's you guys? Okay. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> They're like, this is not necessary. <laughs> okay, you're on again. <laughs> All right, let's keep going here. Uh, rejoices, so I'm rejoicing in my suffering here. Uh, <clears throat> Paul rejoices in his suffering. So right off the thing, right off, the, I put what right there because when I'm reading this, and I read this a lot because the Bible talks about this kind of stuff a lot, my reaction is always, what? He's rejoicing? Like, I just don't like suffering that much. It seems that Paul's okay with it. In fact, more than okay, he rejoices in it. And, he, and this is littered all throughout Paul's letters. And so I, I felt like we just needed to kind of three things. Like, what, what is going on here? What's behind Paul being able to rejoice in suffering? Because you know, I, don't, I don't like suffering at all. I think it's terrible. <laughs> Right? And, and in my, my Western way of thinking, suffering is evil, and I want to get out from under it. But that's not the Eastern way of thinking, at least in the ancient East. That is not actually the Christian way of thinking about suffering, the way Jesus saw it, and the way Paul just outlined it for us, that Christ, what Christ's sufferings brought us in the form of reconciliation with God. And so here we go. First of all, Paul says, He's suffering for the Colossians, which is an interesting statement because he's never met them, right? And so I I think Paul is pulling from this idea that that he's uh, um, revealed in other other letters that when part of the body suffers, we all suffer. When the part of the body rejoices, we all rejoice. And there's just this connectivity and uh, unified aspect of the body of Christ, that he is suffering for the Gentiles um, or for the Colossians, represented ultimately that Paul is the missionary to the Gentiles. And we're going to get to the irony in that in a, in a few minutes here. So Paul's sufferings are a means, are the means God is using to spread the message of the gospel to others. As Bob and I were talking about the sermon before, he reminded me of uh, Acts 9. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good, uh, a good reminder that as uh, Paul was literally knocked off his horse by Jesus, uh, as, he, as Paul was, or his name was Saul at the time, was going along the road, um, going to Damascus, um, bent, hell-bent on taking down the Christians and uh, bringing them back to Jerusalem, throwing them in prison, um, and all that kind of stuff, because he was one of the leaders of the persecution of the church at the time. And so, in, in, on the road to Damascus, 
Jesus appears to him. This is after Jesus had ascended into heaven. So Paul is the last person that we have that Jesus appears and gives this apostleship to. And Paul's response is like, who are you, Lord? <laughs> right? Capital L, if you look in there. It's like, oh. So he knew it was God. And he's like, Jesus, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. At the same time, God had revealed to a man named Ananias that Saul of Tarsus was coming and that Ananias needed to go and pray for him and that his eyes would be open because he was blinded in this encounter and, that to, and to, to give him the message that Paul would suffer incredibly, that he would begin to just barely understand the suffering that, that, that Christ went through, uh, through Paul's life, that there would be tons of suffering in, in that. And so that's, that was Paul's introduction to Christianity. Talk about a, a moment where you got to go, am I, am I really in for this? <laughs> right when God's telling you right off the start, you're going to suffer immensely. Do you say yes still? Paul did. To me, that's incredible. Like God even told him, you're going to suffer a lot if you follow me. And Paul's like, I'm in. And so this is what we have, this suffering uh, that, that as, as he goes, he's, suff- he's suffering from the persecution from, from the Jews who don't like the fact that he's preaching this message of inclusion, that the Gentiles are included in, in God's plan. And then uh, the pushback from some of the, the, uh, the pagan nations where you have Paul in, you know, in Philippi getting thrown in jail or Ephesus, there's a huge riot because uh, so many people are becoming Christians that the, the idol building business is uh, suffering. And so these silversmiths are really upset and they want to they get rid of uh, Paul and his buddies. And so he has persecution from all sides, suffered a lot. And why? It's because reconciliation is a costly business. This is not the natural path, the natural uh, way that, that, that people respond to any kind of crises. They're not, they're not looking for, that's not the first thing that comes to mind, this idea of forgiveness, and repentance, and reconciliation. Right? The world's like, that's craziness. You need to hold on to your hate. You need to, to get that person back. And, and why is it costly? It's because reconciliation and love are joined at the hip. And love is the path that's less traveled because it is difficult. Love is hard. It's it's why Jesus talks about it multiple times. You know, we we know these verses really well where uh, Jesus says, you know, the law and the prophets are summed up in these two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Down to love. Simple, right? Yeah. But not easy. The most difficult thing ever is to walk the path of love, and that's why it's less traveled. Love is hard. It's easier to hang on to resentment. It's easier to gossip. It's easier to try to build yourself up and tear other people down. It's easier to think of self than others. (laughs) This is us, right? This This is who we are. It's our natural state that we are warring against at all times because love is hard. And it's easier to choose the path away from love. Now, I don't want you to miss the irony because of this whole deal. Because Paul is actually the message being lived out. And this is why. Paul was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee. And he, that means he wouldn't even have set foot in a Gentile's home. He wouldn't have nothing to do with the Gentiles. And we read in other scriptures of that he, he said, I obeyed the law perfectly. This is incredible. It's like, what? And yet he was harsh and hard because obeying the law doesn't necessarily mean you're walking the path of love, right? <laughs> For sure. And so what we have here is a man who had wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. Secondly, was also looking to 
stamp out Christianity as, a, as something that was uh, a scourge to the Jews, to get rid of it. That's why he was leading the persecution against the church. This is the guy that God chose. He said, God gave me this stewardship of this message. What's the message? Well, it's the message of res- res- reconciliation that he just talked about. Like, this is Saul of Tarsus. Like, God's kind of funny in some ways when you look at this. It's like, oh yeah, that is kind of funny. That God chose the most unlikely person in the entire world to take his message to the most unlikely people, which was the Gentiles, who had never heard of this God. That's Paul. That he, persecutor, stay away from me. You're unclean, I'm clean. Is now the main conduit through which God, the gospel is reaching the Gentiles. And Gentiles is simply just means non-Jews, if you're not familiar with that term. So we have these two categories, right? <laughs> Jew and non-Jew. Jew and Gentile. And so Paul, the irony is just, Awesome. I love it. It was like, yes. Like, this is what God does. Paul himself is the perfect picture of the reconciliation that God desires between him and humanity and between humanity and each other. Like, it's awesome. So good. Okay, we got to keep going here. Secondly, uh, Paul sees his own suffering as sharing in Christ. Now, there is some interesting language in this text. It's actually a little bit confusing and misleading uh, in some ways, <clears throat> the, way, the way that it translates. Um, and it's be- this idea that somehow Christ's suffering is lacking. Now, this text has been used for multiple different heresies, uh, especially this idea that, um, that Christ, his suffering on the cross, his sacrifice isn't enough that it's something is lacking, so that now it's back on us. We need to add something to it. That's where the idea of penitence comes from. Um, This idea that we have to kind of fill it up, that Christ's suffering wasn't enough to actually deal with our sin, that we need to do something about it as well. And so that's a deviation from the entire gospel that he is is actually laying out in Colossians. That that goes not just in Colossians, but throughout the whole scripture. And so, so that, sorry, that can't be what Paul is talking about here. And so what does he mean? What, what is lacking? And so I, I read uh, quite a few different opinions on this in commentaries. And uh, it's hard to understand what he's talking about. We know what he's not saying, which is what I just said there. He's not saying that somehow Christ's sacrifice is insufficient. That's a deviation from the gospel. So what is, what is he saying? Well, there's a number of things. And here's, here's just where I landed. Here's what I think. I, I, I don't think lacking uh, means that, that Christ, that we have to fill it up with our suffering somehow because it's not enough. I think what, what's going on here um, is actually Jesus' statement on the road to Damascus. When he asked Paul, why, or when Paul asked him, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, who is Paul persecuting? The church. Right? And Jesus is going like, you're persecuting me. And so what I think is happening here, this whole idea of lacking, is that it just simply hadn't happened yet. That the church, that Christ's body would, would suffer in, after Christ ascended into heaven. That it would continue. And that Jesus would share in our sufferings as we suffered, even as we share in his sufferings that he already suffered. And so I think that's the the what Paul is kind of getting at, because that's how he explains it in in other letters a a little more clearly, is that he finds it it a a pleasure to suffer alongside of Christ because of what Christ has done for him, while at the same time, there's this participation back and forth where you're participating in Christ's suffering, and he's actively participating in your suffering today. And so there's, there's nothing lacking in Jesus' suffering when it comes to salvation in the gospel. So I think that's, that's, a kind of, that's important because that text has been misused and uh, used for a few heresies. And so ultimately, in the end, Paul's just embracing the suffering that followed, this sharing back and forth that we suffer in him and he suffers in us. Uh, finally, no, 
By the way, yeah, as I was, uh, in fact, this morning, I kind of had this kind of like, what? I'm like starting the sermon off with suffering. <laughs> it's like, oh, welcome to church. Uh, this should be really fun <laughs> today. Uh, but I, I just thought, oh, it's so important to understand because even my own, like the what there, that somehow suffering is this terrible evil. Uh, and it's, that's how our culture has shaped us to view suffering. And so we need to unshape that a little bit. So Paul is suffering for the body, the church, he says. And so now he's taken it from, I'm suffering for you, Colossian Gentiles, to now, it's actually for everyone. For specifically for the church. And the gospel. And so what we have is Paul's love for Jesus and the church is evident because of his um, perspective of suffering for it. Like he says, this is all worth it. His love for God's people, his love for the message of reconciliation. He believes it so deeply that it's not just some kind of intellectual or theological idea. This is who Paul is. This is what he himself has experienced. And this is why he's like, I can, I can rejoice in the suffering. It's this perspective, it's worth it. I, I think the closest thing we can get, and, and I can't identify with, but there's a whole bunch of ladies in the room that can, is childbirth. Right? Suffering with a purpose changes everything. And so if, if it didn't, there would, there would not be as many kids in here as there is, Right? Does that herd of kids just leaves? It's like, where did everybody go? <laughs> right? Because the suffering is worth it. Because of the purpose that you have these amazing children in your life. It's incredible, right? And it's worth the suffering. So thank you, ladies. You know, men really don't suffer. <laughs> yeah. Um, not like that, anyway. And, uh, and just in case you were thinking of uh, teenagers <laughs> when I brought in the idea of having children, um, that's, and I wasn't talking about you teenagers either. Like, you guys are a pleasure. <laughs> and so Paul's perspective here is this. Suffering for a worthy purpose changes everything. And this is what he writes in 2 Corinthians. And remember, Paul suffered more than anyone else. For our light and momentary troubles. <laughs> I'm like, what? This is Paul calling, like, how many? He was shipwrecked a whole bunch of times. He was beaten almost to death, like, multiple times. He was uh, stoned with, with rocks, uh, people throwing rocks at him. It's like this endless persecution Paul had. And this is how, he, this is what he says these light and momentary troubles. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? I need to have that perspective. That's what in the world. I need that. I don't have that perspective, and I need it. And Paul just exemplifies it for us. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Like, yeah. Paul has this perspective, and that changes everything. That the message of reconciliation is worth giving his life for. And not just to death but to keep living through persecution and hardship and, and all of the things that he had to go through, it was worth it for him. In fact, he saw them light and momentary because the message of reconciliation and being an agent of reconciliation was so important. All right, on to the mystery here. So he keeps going. We talked about his stewardship, that God had chosen him, which is in some ways, just crazy, and just exemplifies the amazing God that we serve, to now the mystery being made known. Now, to set this up, we need to talk about a few things. First of all, the modern Western mind, when we talk about mystery, we're thinking about um, like a puzzle, an impenetrable puzzle, right? Or a a whodunit or some kind of intrigue. That's the Western way of thinking of mystery. Now, in Colossae, the pagan collage, and um, especially the religious culture, would have seen it as initiatory rites and symbols that needed to be hidden from the uninitiated or outsiders. Only the elite 
And the insiders could have that knowledge. So that's kind of the, 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 the pagan Colossian view of, of mystery. Now, the Jews also, ancient Jewish history also has this uh, a, a way of viewing. And this is, this, by the way, this is the one that Paul's using. Um, that, this, that it would mean something that has not yet been made known or revealed. That you actually couldn't know it. It was a mystery. The reason it was a mystery is because you can't know it. It hasn't been revealed. It's not time yet. And so that's the idea of, of, of the Jewish mystery. And so Paul is intentionally using this language. And this is why at the start of this message, we needed to, to talk about these two devi- deviations from the gospel that, that, he's, that he's confronting here. He's intentionally using this Jewish concept of mystery to drive home the inclusive nature of the gospel that is for everyone. This is why he just talked about reconciled and then talked about uh, the Gentiles were once enemies of God and now have been brought close. And the Jews, which is, would be crazy to them, the idea that they would be enemies of God and being brought close. Because Jesus was killed by both the Jews and the Gentiles. It was the Jews that shouted crucify, and it was the Romans that pounded the nails. And so Paul suffered greatly because of this message. Uh, David E. Garland, in his uh, commentary on this, this I, there was just a, he has this great quote, so I'm just like, oh, I have to, I have to, I have to say this. The mystery is something related to God's purposes, which can only be imparted by divine revelation. Humans cannot know or discover this mystery on their own, no matter how clever they might be. All God intended to do was quite inconceivable to human minds. The mystery went against all human reason simply because it was above all human reason. It's one of the reasons why they didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. There were so many things revealed in Jesus, so many mysteries that the people didn't even catch it at all. And so we're just going to go through a couple of the, of the key things that is made known that Paul specifically is, is getting to here. First of all, he set it up with the reconciliation stuff. God had always intended to save the Gentiles. That this was not a plan B somehow, that because the Jews didn't accept it or weren't accepting it enough that, well, I guess we'll take it to the Gentiles and see if they'll take it. That's not, that, you know, it wasn't a plan B. God, is, God wasn't up in heaven going like, oh, again, these people don't want, don't want what I have for them. Oh, well, let's go get somebody else. No, that, that's, that's not plan B. It was from the beginning that God's big plan, right through Abraham, that he would be a blessing to all nations. That God's big plan was to offer salvation to all, both Jew and non-Jew. It was for everyone. And the mystery was not some kind of secret knowledge that needed to be discovered somehow through, through different initiations and, and rites and, uh, and that kind of stuff, and then guarded from outsiders. That's not what it was either. And so Paul is using these two concepts to go like, I'm getting both of you guys here. And confronting the Jewish misconception that salvation was only for the Jews In fact, a lot of the pushback was because of that. The Jews were offended that Gentiles were adopting like their history as their own. It's like, how can that be, (laughs) right? But just think of of all our, our, you know, favorite Bible characters. Like, we're not Jews. That's what we've done. We've adopted it because it becomes part of our history when we become part of God's people. And so God's purpose was to bring, and this is the, the mystery, unbelievable part of the mystery, God's purpose was to bring the two together, Jews and Gentile, to make one new people. And even though we can go back and see texts that talk about it, this was not expected at all. And it was un- they were unable to grasp this. Again, it's because this is the mystery part of it. This is what uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter three. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. There's his suffering for the Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. So Paul didn't know the mystery until it was revealed to him. 
In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. And he goes on to talk about uh, in Ephesians here that, that God was reconciling, he was tearing down the hostility between the two to create this one new person, this one new people. And so this is part of this mystery that's revealed that we get to be included in this. In fact, in that, that, that same passage, uh, in, in Ephesians, Paul is uh, just, he's talking about that, that uh, you Gentiles, like you were lost without hope, without God, without the covenant promises, without any of that stuff. But now you've been reconciled. Christ came for, to, to, to actually change all that, to make one new people. So part of the first part of the mystery is that God always intended to save the Gentiles. The second is Christ in you, which, which by the way means, you know, we don't use this word, and if we were in Texas, it would just be natural. It's like Christ in y'all, right? It's Christ in, in, in all of us. It's a plural usage of the, of the word you. He's talking about you as in you people. <laughs> Christ in us, or Christ in y'all. The hope of glory. Right? What a statement. And this, this is where all the angst, I think, came in, because I'm like, wow, how do you unpack a statement like that? Well, I'm going to do my best. And I think I have to undo a little bit of our thinking before we can understand the impact of this. So, what Paul is communicating here is that Christ's dwelling place, the dwelling place of God, would be in believers. Again, concept. Completely foreign, unable, no one able to understand this until it had been revealed. And so, I'm gonna, I, I want to go through a, a little bit of a, a history here. And I'm going to use the word heaven a bit and um, need to explain what I mean because our view, when we hear the word heaven, what you think is, is you know, somewhere up there with maybe somebody with a harp or something, <laughs> which is just totally not a biblical view of, uh, of heaven, by the way. Uh, so when we're talking about heaven, we're talking about the place where God dwells and his will is done, right? Just like Jesus pl- prayed, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what we have here is we have these two different dimensions, we'll call them. We have heaven and we have earth. And so here's kind of the Bible story wrapped up in a very short few minutes here. Or summarized, sorry. So we start with the Garden of Eden where heaven and earth are in perfect unity. Right, it's seen in the imagery of of God walking in the cool of the garden. Right? He's in the garden with Adam and Eve. This is an amazing, incredible picture. Right? Perfect unity with men, humans, and God. But we know what happens. Sin enters and destroys that perfect unity. And so from Genesis chapter 3, God goes on a mission to actually restore that perfect unity between heaven and earth. And so in each of these cases, and I want us to understand this, we often, and the reason this has come to mind is because uh, so the, the series that we're going through at, at youth, uh, there's the misconception that somehow we're trying to get somewhere. That this idea we're getting, we're trying to get to heaven. That is not a biblical concept. We're not trying to get there. And this is why the whole biblical story is actually the opposite. It's always God coming to us. It's always God descending, not us ascending somehow. And I think it's really important for us to understand. Because if you're just, if you're in this, because you're just trying to get to heaven, well, your primary motivation is fear. It's not love. 
And so I don't have a lot of time to, to get into this, so Kelly and I talked about it this week, and I was like, yeah, today's not the time to really, really unpack all this. That's a whole sermon in itself. But I just want us to follow the story, God descending, coming to dwell. And here we go. So after sin entered the world, we have a bunch of time, and then we get to the tabernacle. So God um, instructed the Israelites to have this tabernacle outside the city, outside the camp. Okay, so we start from out here. God's presence came to dwell in the tabernacle. It was so cool that Moses' face would just glow after he's been communicating to God. It said, like, Moses would talk to God like a friend would talk to a friend. I'm like, what? Wow. And then we have this story of Joshua being in the tent of meeting and, and not wanting to leave, just lingering because the presence of God was there. Incredible. But outside the camp. Well, then we have the next phase where um, Solomon builds the temple. The temple is inside the city. Super significant. The dwelling place of God now be inside the city. And so we have this story in the Old Testament where uh, the dedication of the temple, where the glory of God descends in the temple and it's unbelievable. Everyone's just like, what? What is going on? I can't even imagine what it would have been like. Like God, it was visible. God's glory descending on the temple, just like it was in the most incredible experience that anyone had ever experienced. And God's manifest presence in the holy of holies in the temple. That's the place where God dwelt and that is where heaven and earth met. Same as the tabernacle. It was the place where heaven and earth met because they weren't unified, right? But there's this little bit of sliver of unity in the temple and in the tabernacle. That's why the, ta- the, the, the temple had all of those, those figurines and angels and you know, the cherubim. It was, it was this place where heaven and earth met where God would descend to be and dwell with his people. Well, then the temple was destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar to the ground. What a travesty. This is where God dwelt. No, not a travesty. This is all part of God's plan because the next phase of the temple is Jesus. Jesus even calls himself the temple. Right? He said, tear it down and I'll build it up in three days. Right? And the people are like, what? This is because the temple was rebuilt, the, the physical temple. And they're like, how could he do that? Like, it took like, I don't know how many decades for, to build it. But Jesus said it was talking about his own body. That he himself was the place where heaven came down to meet with us on earth. The dwelling place. Right, and he even says it in Ephesians in a couple verses previous that, that, that God was pleased, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell within him. That's what's going on. Or, or in John chapter one where it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God was setting up a tabernacle is the actual Greek word there used. A tabernacle, the presence of God was now in Jesus. Well, then Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. Now what? Once again, Holy Spirit descends, comes down to us, and fills his people with his presence, right? So now, this is the most incredible thing. The place where heaven and earth now meet The new temple is the people, the people of God. What? Yeah, God's glory resides in the people of God. We are his temple. Right, so we've transitioned from physical places, like the temple and the tabernacle that you had to go to, to Jesus, who came in person, personifying God's glory and heaven on earth, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into the lives of believers who are now 
the temple in which God dwells. That's the mystery. Like, wow, that, this, is, this is all being communicated by Paul here in these statements that he's talking about. Christ in you. This isn't just like a nice uh, phrase. This is like, it has a wallop. It hits hard. Christ in you? What? God's descending now to us again in the form of Jesus living within us. That's why it's the hope of glory. This is the story throughout in fact, in the end times, again, it won't be us you know, going, trying to get to a place. Heaven, in Revelation, the heavenly city, descends to the new earth, the renewed earth. God still, at the very end of all things, is descending, coming down to us. This is the significance of the mystery, the reconciliation that God has done. It's amazing. And so that's, that's the story of the Bible. You know, there's a few other details that we've kind of glossed over, hey? <laughs> but this is, this is what's happening. This is the story of God coming to meet us, and it's all because of love, because he hasn't, doesn't have to do any of this stuff. And no one could have conceived of that. And so here's, uh, here's what I think we need to take away from, from this today. We need to remember something that's very significant. We are his temple. Right? Paul says, or uh, Luke says in Acts, that God doesn't live in, in houses made of wooden stone. He doesn't live in like what we call the churches. Like this isn't God's house. You are God's house. And me, together, if you're a believer, We're God's house. We're his temple. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men in the sight of God, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a temple, to be a holy priesthood. Priests serve in a temple to offer spiritual sacrifices. Sacrifices are offered in the temple. Acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we're being built into this. We're like these stones. He's calling us these, we're, we're these building this spiritual house, this temple. We need, to, we need to bring that kind of thinking in. This is really important. God dwells. This is, this is, we have this message of reconciliation, this, uh, this beacon of hope. Christ in us to the entire world around us. And we are called to be imitators of God and just as he has brought heaven down continually to us, we need to be that doing that too. That's in essence, what is the ministry of reconciliation? It's bringing heaven down to earth because that's God's will. We're bringing heaven down down to earth. Now I'm going to steal this from a conference that I went to last week. What's the alternative? This is what one of the speakers was talking about and it just hit hard. The alternative is if we are not bringing heaven down through this ministry of reconciliation, we are bringing hell up. I just sat there going like, (laughs) if we are not participating in bringing, actively participating in bringing heaven here, then we are, there's no kind of middle ground. Then we're bringing hell in, into our lives and into the, those around us. And he went, he went on to say, like, when we, when we, when we um, hold on to, to, uh, to unforgiveness, to, to bitterness, resentment, he said, this is what we do. We bring hell up into our lives and to the lives around us. That's not who we are. Agents of reconciliation, we bring heaven down. And this is why reconciliation is so central to the gospel. And it's why I think Rob did such a great job last week. He just brought it to life for us. It's awesome. Secondly, God's presence changes everything. What we need to take, remember, if we are his temple, his presence dwells in us corporately, but also in us as individuals. His presence, he's with you. He's with us. 
and it changes everything. So we need to be encouraged by this. God is dwelling within you. And I, I, like I've, had, I've talked to actually quite a few of you about this, is that we, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't see the impact we have lots. We don't see the presence of God in our lives like the people around us do, especially in our workplaces, the people who don't know God. They see it, and you may not, probably not, but they see it because it's his presence. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's incredible. They see it, and they, they can't maybe put a finger on it, and if you say, well, I think it's Jesus, they're like, no, 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 it's got to be something else. <laughs> but it's there. God's presence changes everything. So be encouraged. You may not see it. People around you will. And finally, this hope of glory. That it isn't about some kind of future thing flying around playing a harp. Like <laughs> a picture of heaven. This is not what's going on here. The hope of glory is because Christ is in you. That he dwells within us and that he is actively doing right now what God's purpose is for eternity to, to conform you into the image of his son. One degree of glory to the next. That's what he's doing. If you're a believer, that's what he's doing in your life. He's making you more like Jesus. And we share, and ultimately will fully share in Christ's glory. Let's pray. Mm-hmm.